So, thank you for coming to listen to me. Can you hear okay? Is it good acoustics? Okay. So I decided not to use slides so that we could actually have some dialogue. And uh, further up. okay, Just that'd be fine. Since the seats aren't filled and there's a fan right there. Ah. <laughs> No, the seats are not filled. <laughs> I think that there is, too, there's a walk. There's um, domestic violence walk. That, that, that oh, domestic okay. violence walk. Oh, so really? that's happening right now. Um, so it's just happening at the same time. Yeah. Everything always happens at the same time. Oh, right. oh. Like health nurses are going to come in. Holidays for our food is great. Oh, no, no, no. You're supposed to eat. This is lunch and learn, right? So you're supposed to be eating. So um, feel free to interrupt with comments anytime. We don't have to, you know, I, I can rattle my mouth for a really long time, but if you have things you wanna say, that would be fine too. So um, yesterday I gave the long introduction of myself, and so today I'll just say, if you wanna know that one, buy the book, <laughs> Coyote Medicine. <laughs> but um, I'll, I'll just say briefly, I, I'm sort of a bicultural person. I grew up, in Cherokee um, culture and eventually found my long lost father who's Lakota and, and became immersed in Lakota culture. And um, we've been, Barbara and I, um, have been looking at how to bring culture into healthcare. And that's really what I wanna talk about today. And it turns out that culture is medicine. And um, just like exercise is medicine. So culture and exercise, <laughs> two good things. And, um, you know, when I was growing up, people went to traditional healers. This was in southeastern Kentucky. And they got, some of them got well. I mean, not everyone did. But then not everyone gets well who comes here. So, um, but we didn't have a sense that that um, you couldn't get well from even serious illnesses. It was, I grew up in that notion that it's up to the spiritual dimension, it's up to the spirits, whether they help you or not. And you can ask, but they may or may not respond. But if you don't ask, well, you don't get any help. So, so there were a lot of local people who knew how to ask. Some of them were Cherokee. Some of them were um, fundamentalist Christians. We had the snake handlers and the holy rollers. I tried to avoid the snake handlers. They're a little scary, if you ask me. <laughs> but um, they were, it, when I was growing up in the 50s, there wasn't very much in the way of healthcare in southeastern Kentucky. And so people had to rely on the traditional ways of healing, such as groundhog grease. Up here, I, I suspect that one might use bear grease, but in Kentucky, you, you, you would render the fat of a groundhog and rub it on aching joints. And um, everyone believed that it was a miracle cure for just about anything. And um, if you haven't tried it, I recommend it. Groundhog is tasty, by the way, uh, as well because you have to eat it before you can render the, while you render the grease, then you eat the meat. Um, so, you know, where I was growing up, we were, we ate groundhogs, squirrels, whatever we could get. Um, my grandmother had an amazing garden. August was constant canning. I saw so many of those ball jars. I couldn't believe it. But, you know, we ate all winter on what she canned in August. And that was pretty good. So, um, so when I got to medical school, I was a little bit surprised that there wasn't a course on healing. You know, I, I looked in the catalog, <laughs> it didn't exist. You probably didn't have one in your training either, I'm guessing, no. And so that was a bit of a shock for me. I think it was probably Dr. Kildare and Ben Casey that inspired me to become a doctor. and and. I, did, I couldn't find them at Stanford Medical School. <laughs> they didn't have those characters. Though um, what inspired me to go into family medicine was my six-week rotation on the West Coast 
of Point Reyes National Seashore, which is a beautiful place. And I, I worked with four doctors at the Point Reyes Station Health Center. And that was in the 70, early 70s. And I, I got to give Grace Slick an allergy shot. And, you know, I got to tend to a wound of Jesse Colin Young because they were all living out there in those days. It was before they were so famous. And uh, so I became hooked on family medicine and as a kind of medicine that was embedded in the community because that was the way it was in Point Ray Station. There was one group, one office, that was it. And if you wanted anything else, you had to go way over the hill to Marin County, to Marin County proper, which would have been San Rafael, some of those places. So, um, so I've been interested in, in traditional culture and, and those healing methods for a long time. When I was younger and also in medical school, I went, I visited, when I had aches and pains, emotional or physical, I visited Cherokee healers and, and got doctored with hands-on and also um, verbal methods, you know, prayer and, and um, ceremony. And um, that's, that's been true for me pretty much um, since then, though um, there came a time when I did use Western medicine with, for it. Both of my hips are titanium now. That worked out well. <laughs> so so I, I'm, I'm a fan of joint replacement. Um, but once upon a time, I'll tell you a story. I was, I was on the faculty at the University of Saskatchewan and I had a ski trip planned with my son and um, I wrenched to my knee and I could barely walk. And I didn't want to let that get in the way of our, our skiing. So in those days, I was hanging out with an elder by the name of John Charles. And John was an amazing man. He, he had trained as an Anglican priest and it worked as an Anglican priest until he was 60 years old, at which time he came down with brain cancer. And he went to, um, the conventional doctors and they told him probably he had about six weeks to live. And he, he didn't really like that. So he tried Christian healing. That didn't work. So he tried um, his tradition, which was Cree healing. He went to a woman healer who people knew to be useful on his reserve, which was Sturgeon Lake First Nation. And um, when I met him, he was 80 years old. So he'd lived more than six weeks. Uh, but John was in a quandary because here he'd spent his whole life being an Anglican. And, and now it was Cree uh, spirituality that had helped him get well. And so he, he, um, took, he went on a fast and prayed over it. And he realized that it was all one. He had this vision of the four directions and um, these elders in each direction smoking their chinupas, their sacred pipes, and then Christ in the middle. And he said, oh, I can do both. <laughs> I can be both. And so that's, that was what he was doing. And John ha had a, a clinic every Sunday morning. And so the, the clinic was the front room of his house. And um, he would come in the front door and sit down. There were couches and whatnot. And, the TV was always blaring with Sunday morning cartoons. There were always kids running around and teenagers running in and out, cooking themselves breakfast. John had a little bedroom that he did his doctoring in and he would come out and get someone and take them into the bedroom. And when he was done with them, he would bring them back out and, and, and people would sit in a circle and, and engage in informal healing with each other. And so, it was a custom of mine to bring people to John on Sunday morning for doctoring. And um, after the doctoring was done, we would do a revitalization ceremony, which you might know as a sweat lodge, but we're being counseled by the elders not to call it that anymore because they said that's a Jesuit term. 
And the Lakota term is Inipikaga. And the best translation we're told is revitalization ceremony because Ini is breath and Inipi is they breathe and Kaga is ceremony. So it's a ceremony in which they breathe. And it's, what you breathe is the vapors coming off the st hot stones. So when you breathe that in, it revitalizes you. It wakes you up, it brings spirit into your body and you feel better. And it chases the toxins out of you. And we're, we're taught that what you see on people's skin is not sweat, it's toxins. So don't call it sweat, we've been told. And I, I understand that uh, people do a variation of that ceremony here. And, and most cultures around the globe do. We've encountered the ceremony in Scotland. The Celtics um, did this ceremony. Only amazingly, they built their structures out of stones and they didn't use glue. <laughs> they just, they had this technology where they could just put the stones on top of each other and they wouldn't fall down on top of them. And we have friends who are still trying to figure out how they do that. <laughs> so uh, some of our friends who practice Celtic spirituality are still, are still using the Lakota style structures, you know, with the willow, bent willow and canvas coverings because they can't figure out how, they, how to do it in their old ways. But I think they'll get it sooner or later. And of course the Finns, you know, and, and the Lapland people do these kinds of ceremonies. It goes all across Russia, Northern Russia. And um, in Mexico, they call it Temescal. And they have little adobe structures that then they cover the tops of. So this seems to be something people figure out all over the world as a, as a health promoting activity. And um, so anyway, when I, when I hurt my knee, I came to see John as, as a, client this time and he brought me in the little room and he sang some songs and and um, put his hand on my knee and said some prayers and then he covered me with a blanket and he stuck a skillet of sage underneath the blanket and he almost killed me you know, I almost died of asphyxiation <laughs> and he whipped it off and he said all right you're better and I said cool and then he gave me a charm to put on my put on the mirror of my truck. And he said, this will help you and it'll prevent speeding tickets too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't test the speeding ticket theory because I was a little scared of the Gendarmerie Royale du Canada, the RCMP. So, um, so I didn't try that out. But, so my knee was a whole lot better, but it wasn't perfect. So I, I went back the next week and I said, I said, John, it's better, but it's not perfect. And he said, he said, well, he said, I've been getting information. And he said, someone cursed you. And I said, and he told me, he described the person. And I said, oh yeah, I know that person. <laughs> and he said, well, you gotta pray for her. He said, because that's the best way to turn around a curse. Pray for the person that cursed you. And he said, and, and, and we'll doctor you again. So I went back under the blanket. <laughs> And again, almost died this time. This time I knew to hold my breath for a while. <laughs> so I survived it. And he gave me an even bigger charm. And he said, put it on the front door of your house. And, and, and then you'll be good. And I was. So a week later, I was skiing with my son. I thought, how did that work? You know, I, I was teaching in the family medicine program at the time. And I told all the residents about what had happened to me. And they're all like, that's impossible. I'm like, well, look at me, I'm walking. How is it not, how is it impossible? And they said, well, that just couldn't happen. I said, well, it did. You saw me three weeks ago. They didn't like it. And I don't know how it worked, I can't tell you. That's been a question I've been pondering for years. Is how do people do that? How did John get well from his brain cancer? We have a friend in South Dakota who had pancreatic cancer about 12 years ago and was again told by the Indian Health Service Hospital to pack it up and take care of her affairs. There was nothing they could do. And she's still walking around 12 years later after getting doctored and probably almost dying in the sweat lodge <laughs> with, with some healers from Pine Ridge Reservation. So how does that work? 
you know, one of the things we know is that what we call the placebo response is amazing. And we don't take enough advantage of it. After my hip surgery, the nurse came in with the shot of morphine and I said, I don't want that, I want the placebo. And she said, what? And I said, yeah, I want placebo. I like it better. And she said, I can't give you placebo. I said, why not? I want it. <laughs> and she said, well, you can't have it. <laughs> so, so I didn't have anything. And, uh, and that was okay. It wasn't that bad. But, um, you know, I think probably placebo healing was a big part of conventional medicine until probably 1940 would be my guess. It was, that was, um, what was it, 1937 when penicillin was discovered? So, um, so this, this, you know, Herbert Benson calls it the self-healing response. And, and the other thing that I've noticed is that intention is incredibly effective. That um, if you intend to help someone, it makes an enormous difference. And I did a sort of double-blind study on myself not too long ago. I got, a, I got a cold sore on my lip, and, and it was on both sides. And so I decided I would put cocoa butter on one side and nothing on the other. And I didn't really believe cocoa butter would do anything. But, but it turned out that the side that I put the cocoa butter on got better like several days faster than the side that I didn't. And I thought, that's not possible. <laughs> How did that work? And then I thought, oh, it was my intention to treat myself. That made a difference. You know, the fact that I did something for myself made a difference. And I still want to figure out how to do a double-blind trial on that, because I think it would be a really interesting study to look at intent to treat um, and how that, what effect that has on people. So, um, so, what I learned over the years is that culture, cu traditional cultural healing can work. Not always. Um, and we, we, we did some studies on this. I published one in 1999. I'm, I'm not gonna give you all the references, but if you, you can read my books and they're in there. Um, or just go to Scholar Google and type in my name and you'll get all the papers, they'll all come up. Um, or send me an email and I'll send you the papers. Anything that interests you, I can send it to you. But we looked at, at um, people who worked with traditional healers and what kinds of outcomes they had with particular diseases. And we had a comparison group because it's really hard to do a randomized double blind control trial of traditional healers. So what we did was create a comparison group using the computer, pulling out people of the same age and same diseases, um, same gender, same socioeconomic status, things like that. And we found that, that um, in general, traditional healing performed really well. Now, you can't say, um, you know, it's not a pure study, so you can't say exactly how well, but you can say, well, it sure wasn't crazy for these people to go for traditional healing. You know, they got better. And then we, we did an interesting study of people, about uh, 50 people with cancer who went to work with traditional healers. And we published that one in, I think, about 2009. And we found um, similar results, you know, some really impressive results. And I interviewed uh, all of the people. One of the women was really interesting. She had um, cancer that was metastatic to her liver. And it was in multiple places. And after her work with the healer, it had coalesced into one place. And, and her doctors were able to remove it from her liver. And, um, and the healers gave her some instructions on how to stay well. And she followed those instructions for about six years. And then she stopped. And her cancer came back. Now, maybe it would have come back anyway. I don't know. But, um, but the healer's perspective was, if you, want to, if you want to get well, 
you sometimes have to make a sacrifice. And, and when, you, when you make a sacrifice, when you make an agreement, you know, um, you have to follow that agreement. You can't go back on your word. Because if you go back on your word, maybe the healing will go away. So that was a, an interesting story, you know, that emerged from that study. And then we did another study that we published, I think in about 2014, um, where we, we figured out a way to measure spiritual transformation. And we, we used captive graduate students, because they're always good for something, you know, you sit them down in a class and make them do stuff. And so what we did was to come up with a scheme for them to rate people's stories and to figure out um, if there was no spiritual transformation, minimal, mild, moderate, or profound. And we found out that graduate students could do that, which makes them smarter than monkeys. We, <laughs> monkeys probably couldn't do that. So, um, so we published that study, and then we looked at um, the stories of people who worked with traditional healers, because the traditional healers said that it was spiritual transformation that caused the most profound healing. And so we correlated the degree of healing with the degree of spiritual transformation. And we found that it, that it correlated at some ridiculous level, like P less than 0 0.0001. And we said, well, you know, whatever is going on, it seems to fit what the elders are saying. That, that when they were able to engage people in a profound spiritual transformation, it correlated with profound healing. And, um, and that was pretty exciting. <clears throat> so, so I want to I wanna move into talking a little bit about um, stories. Because everywhere we go in indigenous territory, stories are important. Stories matter. There's a, a wonderful quote from um, Leslie Silka, who is, her book is the most prescribed reading in freshman English in universities across North America. And um, she has this wonderful passage that says, all there is is stories. And stories is what protects us against um, everything that assails us. And without the stories, we would disappear and die. And um, so I'm pretty sure that there's amazing stories wandering around this hospital. Now in, in medicine, we don't often take the time to listen to those stories. You know, we, especially now with the electronic health record, you know, we, have, we all have check boxes. You guys have check boxes. I hear you use the same evil device that we use, which is Cerner Millennium. Yeah. Hmm? Epic. Epic here. I don't know Epic, but it's probably as evil as Cerner. And, and it, it pushes you into a way of thinking where, where it's all, okay, you have this symptom, you have that symptom, you have the third symptom. And, and we lose track of getting the story. You know, we don't say, and when was the last time you were well? And what was the first thing you noticed? And then what happened? And then what happened? And, and to get a real illness narrative of how things unfolded. We don't often take the time to do that. And sadly, we're training patients out of telling stories about how they got ill. And William Osler, who's a famous Baltimore dude, you've probably encountered him at least once in your schooling, said that 96% um, of the diagnoses can be made from the history. But nowadays, it's the MRI that makes most of the diagnoses. You know, we're, we, we're, we've become over-reliant upon imaging and under-reliant upon stories, upon histories. So, um, so we just finished a study in our clinic in Maine. We, I, I work at a residency teaching clinic. Um, and what we did was to use captive medical students, because you can order them around, can't order residents around because they talk back, but um, 
So we used captive medical students to get life stories from patients. And we used an outline that came from Northwestern University called the Northwestern University Life Story Interview. And we then put the life story in the electronic health record using the free text function. And we labeled it life story interview. And then we notified the resident who was taking care of the patient to read it. And to my surprise, they all read it. You know, I, I didn't know if they would because we were prepared to do a one page synopsis. We didn't have to because they were all interested. And before they read it, we had given the patients the doctor patient relationship questionnaire and the doctor. So they rated their relationship with each other. And then um, at three months, six months, and 12 months, we gave it to them again. And we found out that the doctor patient relationship improved statistically significantly for both parties, but more so for the doctors than the patients, which was interesting. The doctors um, changed. And one of the really interesting things that happened in our clinic is that the residents would come into the room where the preceptors sit and instead of, instead of rolling their eyes and saying, oh my God, you know, they would say, that person needs a life story interview. <laughs> Quick, find us a medical student. And they recognized that some of the people that annoyed them the most would annoy them a lot less if they knew their story. And um, we just finished analyzing the data for a presentation we're making at the European Psychiatry Association in April. And we found out that patients' perception of pain improved statistically significantly also as a result of being in this study. Their, um, sadly, their anxiety and depression didn't change, but um, I suspect it's because their miserable life situations didn't change. And um, my sense from our population is that their depression and anxiety is more a function of their lives and their social circumstances than anything else. But um, now uh, we, we got funding to do another study. So we're going to do a study where uh, some of the patients get live story interviews and some of them don't. And we're going to see if we can um, quantify the difference. Everybody will do the questionnaires. So we'll have a control group of people who, who just got the gift cards for showing up and doing the questionnaires and people who got the life story interview that was shared with their doctor. So that'll be an interesting next step in our process. And we're, we've applied for funding to do a study where the doctors do the interviews. And we have this um, plan, sneaky plan, where we'll give the doctors a nice fancy $50 gift card for doing the life story to get them to do it. So we'll see what happens. We'll see if we can get that funded. But, um, but the really exciting news from my point of view is that just getting the patient's life story reduced their perception of pain on the McGill pain inventory. And that seemed positive, especially in these days where we can't throw oxycodone at people anymore. Um, which is probably a good thing <laughs> since it, it actually turns out to not work long term. Um, but, um, but so that's kind of, that's something that's also exciting. And um, I want to, I want to just read you a quote from, from a, a woman whom I enjoy reading, uh, Renee Linklater. Renee is the Aboriginal Services Coordinator for the Center for Mental Health and Addictions in Toronto, which is called CAMH. And um, she wrote a book called Decolonizing Trauma, which is a really amazing book if you get a chance to, to read it. So she says, um, she's talking about her story, but also the stories she collected of elders who were engaged in traditional cultural healing 
either within the healthcare system or in the shadows of the healthcare system. And so she said, um, this is a story. It is just one story among a universe of stories told from my perspective. Someone else would tell the story differently. This story takes place on Turtle Island. I'm hesitant in putting this story out there because as Thomas King acknowledges, for once a story is told, it cannot be called back. Once told, it is loose in the world. And so when we, when we gather patient stories and we share them, we put them out into the world. They get loose. They wander around, especially if they're in the electronic health record. And, and they can't be called back, but they appear to, to produce a ripple that's a really positive ripple. And to my, to my, also to my surprise, all of the patients wanted to tell their story. That, that the only reasons people didn't do it is because they, their ride was waiting and they couldn't stick around. Because if you know about, I don't know if you have something like Lynx here, we have a system called Lynx and the people on um, what we call Maine Care, which is Medicaid in Maine, um, they order their rides three days in advance and they have to tell them when to pick them up. And if they uh, can't miss the ride or they're stuck, you know. So, um, so anyone who, could, who didn't have to worry about transportation really enjoyed staying and telling their story. So, um, so we all have stories. And what, what I want to get to next, and I've got a few notes here, is, is to talk a little bit about trauma because a lot of people here have a story of trauma. And, and you can imagine how it might feel when the colonizers came and never left. And you certainly can see that in Maine, and it's especially poignant on Indian Island, which is the reservation closest to us, um, where um, the, the reservation is an island surrounded by a river. And all around the island, are the non-native people. And so you're surrounded. There's that sense of enclosure. And once upon a time, there was no bridge to the island. You had to take a canoe back and forth. I think it was only in the 60s or 70s that the bridge was built. Do you, do you know when the bridge was built? Yeah. So, um, so there was this constant reminder of, of being um, put on an island. You know, and, and having once had free reign of the whole territory, you know, having, um, it was a good life in Maine before the invasion. The game, 1950, yeah. You know, before Europeans, there was incredible game, probably like here. Um, there was moose and bear and all kinds of other good things to eat. And I've read descriptions that you could just take your canoe and go out into the Gulf of Maine and the cod would jump into your boat. They were that plentiful. You didn't even have, you didn't even have to bother fishing. <laughs> you know, the fish would just jump into the canoe. Um, it's not that way anymore. But thanks to lawsuits by the Penobscot Nation, the Penobscot River has gone from 25 salmon swimming upriver to 1,000 because the Penobscot Nation had a treaty that said that they should be able to um, survive from fishing in the river. And so their lawsuit was that they couldn't survive from fishing in the river because the fish were all dying. And so therefore the government of Maine had to clean up the river and, and put in salmon um, swimways, you know, to get around the dam, the dams that had been put in place. And Maine fought it tooth and nail, but they, the Penobscot Nation prevailed. And now the Penobscot Nation has better fishing and everyone's happier. And our um, most recent governor, who was a, a bit of a, a curmudgeon, um, was trying to get the cities along 
the river to sue the tribe to get back the right to pollute the river. <laughs> and no one would join the, his lawsuit because they said, hey, the mills are gone. And this is, having clean water is really good for tourism. You know, forget it. <laughs> we like tourists. We want them. You know, people can, people aren't afraid to put their kayak into the river anymore. You know, that's a good thing. People put their canoes in the river. We like it. And so that didn't go anywhere. But, um, but indigenous people have, everyone has a story of trauma. Everyone has a trauma story if only historical trauma. And I just wanna give you another quote from Renee that I like. She said, trauma has created a climate of systematic oppression, violence, and abuse. Pre-colonial trauma was predictable and consistently set in a cultural context. And its context revolved around death, tribal wars, starvation, separation, etc. <clears throat> in contemporary times, trauma takes the forms of sexual abuse, rape, psychological assaults, accidents, environmental disasters, wars, and holocausts. So it's a different kind of trauma that, that we have to deal with. The trauma of the residential schools, um, I suspect there were residential schools in Alaska. Um, the trauma of being put on a reserve or reservation and having nothing to do. And I think probably, you know, from my observations in the lower 48, um, unemployment is probably the biggest contributor to drug abuse that there is. So if, if, you, if you're just sitting around with nothing to do and no meaning or purpose, drugs look pretty attractive. Why not? Um, and we probably would do more to counter drug abuse if we could create jobs for people than anything else that I can think of. And, and that would be a way of decolonizing trauma. So, um, so what could you guys do? Well, um, I think that most government sponsored or corporate sponsored or large hospital system sponsored healthcare is top down. You know, we certainly found that in Saskatchewan. We, we did a study where, in which we interviewed 851 indigenous people about how did they feel about the healthcare that Health Canada was providing for them. They weren't really very happy with it. And, and um, there were a few things that, that they wanted to be known, they wanted to say. One was nobody ever asked them what they wanted. Like nobody ever came around and, and did focus groups or participatory action circles or, um, and just said, well, hey, what would you guys like your healthcare to look like? It just got imposed by the government. Here's your healthcare, take it or leave it. And, and the healthcare providers were really frustrated by the passive resistance that the people showed in not using the healthcare. So I, I would go to these remote health clinics in the north of Saskatchewan, places that you have to fly into. Um, in the winter, you can drive across the ice if you're brave. But in these days of global warming, I don't recommend it. So, um, and, and so the doctors coming in, many of them were from Pakistan, India, and, and they just had nothing good to say about the locals. They're like, well, they don't take care of their diabetes. And, and they don't come for their appointments when they're scheduled. You know, and, and I, I tried to say, well, maybe because it doesn't feel like what they want. It doesn't feel friendly to them. Maybe it's because nobody ever asked them what they wanted their healthcare to look like, or if they wanted their own healers to be a part of these services. And, um, and that's when we interviewed the people, that's what they told us. They wanted someone to ask them what they wanted. 
and, and they wanted an understanding that the unit of service should be to the family and not the individual. So they, they wanted health care that addressed the family as a whole and not Joe here or Fred here or Frank over there. And, you know, I, I learned this once upon a time, I was at the University of Arizona and I learned that if you didn't bring the oldest living female relative into the office, that whatever you told the patient to do would not happen. So you might as well just get over your hip problem and just bring in the old grandmother and, and explain to her what you thought needed to be done. And if you could get her agreement, then things would change. And, and I had one patient who, um, he, he lost about 50 kilos, had a heart transplant, um, was, was released with a strict diet. And over time he gained back 60 kilos. And I, I'm like, what happened? And he said, well, I can't eat apart from the family. I can't eat differently from everyone else in the family. You know, because eating is a social event. It's a social affair. And to have your own separate food is not going to work in that cultural context of, of southwestern Arizona. And um, what we would have had to do is bring the whole family in and work on how the whole family could eat differently. And we didn't do that. But that's what we needed to do if we wanted this guy to keep the, the weight off. Um, so um, what, what else did they say? They said they, they wanted acknowledgement of the spiritual dimensions of healing. They didn't, they didn't want it to be brushed off. And, and uh, you know, when I, when I talked to the residents at the clinic in, in Saskatoon, where I was teaching, about my knee getting better, you know, they brushed it off. They, they, they did what Megan Bang, who's a, a Ojibwe philosopher of science, calls um, epistem epistemological genocide. So they dismissed a way of knowing and being that because it didn't fit into biomedical um, positivistic empirical science. I had another experience in Arizona about this. Um, I got a call uh, to come from one of the orthopedic residents um, because he was just puzzled and he didn't know what to do. And, and it turned out that he was seeing a 12 year old um, for a fractured femur and he was looking at um, the x-ray from the last time that the child had been to the university hospital. And the chest x-ray was full of tumors. And the prognosis was grim. And, and he said to me, he said, this can't be the same person. So I said, well, why don't we go talk to the mother? You know, <laughs> she probably has some light that she could shed on this. Being an orthopedic resident, he was afraid to talk to the mother without my help. So we went together and she said, oh yeah, yeah, he came down here, um, you know, seven years ago for cancer, but you guys didn't do such a good job then. We had to go home and see the traditional healer, you know, for things to get better. She said, I hope you guys are better with bones than you are with cancer. And, and he said, what am I gonna do? I can't tell my attending about this. He'll think I'm nuts. And I'm like, well, just don't say anything and see if he notices. <laughs> and the attending didn't notice, and it was all good. So because, you know, it wasn't a chest problem, it was a femur problem. So, um, so there is this, this traditional cultural healing that is happening all over the place. And, and people feel a lot better when conventional practitioners say, Oh, wow, that's amazing. Instead of saying, well, that's impossible. That didn't happen. That couldn't happen. You know, and, you know, my approach is to whoever the healer is, whatever the healing is, 
you know, whether it's um, Filipino faith healing where they pull the chicken gizzards out of the person, <laughs> you know. I knew a Cherokee guy who used to do that. He was amazing at the sleight of hand trick of pulling bloody meat out of people. But it, it worked. And I don't know why it worked, but it worked for some people. And, and it worked better for people in that culture than it did for people coming from another culture and trying you know, to step into that culture. It didn't work so well in that context. But we, there's something similar has been um, found with Chinese medicine. There was a study that was done in London where they looked at the efficacy of traditional Chinese medicine in Beijing with um, Chinese people in London with Chinese immigrants, and in London with non-Chinese patients. It worked best in Beijing, it worked medium in London with immigrants, and it worked least well in London with English people who were not Chinese. So there's something to say for doing what's in your culture as opposed to stepping out of your culture into someone else's culture. So, um, so one of the other interesting studies we did was a, a study of doing talking circles in the waiting room of primary care clinics in Saskatchewan after hours. And so we, we, we found elders to, to officiate in these talking circles and people would come, you know, we, we presented it as come talk about the, the needs of the community. What are the, what are the needs of this community in terms of healthcare you know, and, and anything else you want to talk about. And inevitably, people talked about their own healthcare needs. And um, we had some pre and post questionnaires. So we used something called the MyMop2, which is developed in the UK. And it's a way of looking at change across multiple conditions. So you get to pick the condition that's bothering you the most, the second most, and then you rate how severely it, it affects your, your life, how, bad, how big a problem it is for you. And then there's a quality of life measure and a, a activities of daily living measure. So um, we did pre and post questionnaires and we figured we'd probably get an effect if people came at least four times. So we had 450 some people who came at least four times and filled out our questionnaires. And we found that, that their chief, their major complaint, their major problem, improved statistically significantly from beginning to after four times in the talking circle. And the effect size was every bit as good as going to see the doctor, especially for emotional issues. So um, we thought, wow, that's cheap. It was free. <laughs> Nobody, you know, probably Health Canada should have paid the elders, but they didn't. Um, but it was it was just part of the the giveaway, the give back the, of these elders for the community to do that. And and people really liked coming and being able to to talk in a talking circle format. So um, so I I want to finish by talking about some hospitals that have incorporated, hospitals and clinics who have incorporated traditional cultural healers into their work. So um, one of the clinics that I especially like is the Anishinaabe Health Clinic in Toronto. It's in downtown Toronto. And you can come in to the front door and you can ask to see the traditional healer or the conventional doctor. Go left, go right, or go both ways. You're allowed. And it, it's two-eyed seeing, which is a, a concept that I would marshal of um, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, created, which is to say that the indigenous way of seeing the world is equally valid and potentially useful as the biomedical way of seeing the world. And they're not in competition. And you can actually use both. And you don't have to reduce one to the other. To explain things that you can let them coexist. Um, there's also a health center in Thunder Bay, Ontario that does this. There's the Aboriginal Health Unit in Winnipeg, which is sponsored by the University of Manitoba. 
that has this option to see the traditional healer or the conventional doctor. And um, maybe you could do it here. It's a thought. And I suspect that there's traditional healers at work in your community. You may know them, you may not. You may know them and not know that they're traditional healers. You know, we, we've had experiences of coming across traditional healers in the funniest places. Once upon a time, I had the, the honor of giving a talk at Harvard. They didn't invite me back though. And so we leaving Mass General Hospital, um, the, the um, airport shuttle guy was playing this amazing music. And, and I said to him, I said, wow, that sounds like ceremonial music. And he said, yeah, man, that voodoo music. I said, oh, wow. I said, do you do, do, you do voodoo? And he said, yeah, man. And, and it turned out that he was one of the traditional healers for Boston Haitian community. And, and everybody in the van got a little further back, you know, except for me, I moved forward. And I'm like, hey, does that, does that goat head really disappear? And he said, yeah, man. He said, I don't know how it does that. I said, that's really cool. <laughs> so there he was, you know, driving the airport shuttle as his day job and doing healing for his community as his night job. And so everywhere in the world that we've gone, people are doing this. And wouldn't it be kind of interesting if, if they could come out into the open and we could collaborate with them? There's a hospital in California that, that Barbara mentioned yesterday, it, where um, they have a, it's in Merced, California, and they have a, a huge Hmong community. And um, the US government, in their infinite wisdom, when they had to relocate the Hmong during the fall of Vietnam, decided to put them in Merced, California. I have no idea why they put them in Merced, California. <laughs> it doesn't look like where they come from. Um, but that's where they put them. And so there's this huge Hmong community and they just weren't doing what the doctors told them. And, and so somebody had the brilliant idea that they ought to bring in the local community and, and figure it out and just talk it out and, and find ways to be cooperative with the local healers. And when they did that, everything got better. And, and there was actually a book written about this, um, they catch me if I fall down, I think is the, yeah, yeah. And uh, we got to, we went to a conference in, uh, at Dominican University in San Rafael, California, and we got to meet some of these people, which was really special. And we got to watch some of the Hmong healers do their work. And um, for two hours, they, they did their thing. And I have to say, it got to be a little repetitious for me to sit there and watch them for two hours. But I'm sure if I was Hmong, I would have been in trance and would have just not even noticed that the time had passed. So, um, so that was really pretty special. So I've probably rattled my mouth enough here. I've, I've come to the end. And um, 